Thank you so much for this wonderful invitation. It's a great pleasure to be talking here at the uh, Institut Misesa. Um, I'm very grateful for this invitation. I'm very grateful that you translated this book. Uh, that was published in English by uh, the American Institute for Economic Research and that I author with Peter McCloskey. Um, it's really a pleasure to address you. And um, I just want to reassure you that uh, this is not going to be uh, neither such a good lecture like Mateusz's one, uh, neither such an intense lecture like the one he gave us. Because he's been struggling uh, with heavy weight in economic thinking. I'm going to be struggling with the lightweight in economic thinking. But, you know, sometimes lightweights are as dangerous and as influential as heavyweights are. Um, so I, I just wanted to start, you know, as an historian of thought, uh, with two quotations. Uh, two quotations that are very likely to be well known to all of you. So I'm not going to be uh, spending a lot of time on them. But they're interesting in this contest because these two quotes I'm going to be showing you are completely absent. They are out of the intellectual scheme. Uh, of the persons, and particularly the person I'm going to be talking about later on. So this is a very famous sentence from Adam Smith, Wealth of Nation. Consumption is the sole end and purpose of all production. Okay? And the interest of the producer ought to be attended to only so far as it may be necessary for promoting debt of the consumer. But we are at the Mises Institute, so let's get a quote from Ludwig von Mises. Um, as, as Guido Ullsmann knows way better than me, Mises says this kind of thing in a number of instances throughout his life and his work. But this is from bureaucracy, and I think it's a rather effective quote. The capitalists, the enterprisers, and the farmers are instrumental in the conduct of economic affairs. They are at the helm and steer the ship but they're not free to shape its course. They're not supreme. They are steersmen only, bound to obey unconditionally the captain's order. The captain is the consumer. Both of these two uh, sentences, I mean, whatever the rhetoric of consumer, consumer sovereignty, which is often used in a rather anti-market way these days, but both, two, but both these two quotes actually point out to the fact um, that to put it in a, in a, uh, in a rather simple way, um, the market economy is not a matter of authorship. Uh, it is not the case that somebody, for example, is writing, uh, is producing, you know, uh, the story of a product. Uh, as if he's writing a novel. You need constant feedback mechanism in the market playing uh, out. Um, businessmen are not simply you know, conceiving something and uh, uh, consumers are not simply passive receivers of whatever is happening in the businessman mind. This is not uh, what is taught these days by the sort of people we, uh, Dieter McCloskey and I, try to struggle with uh, in this little book. Uh, there is, believe it or not, a nouvelle vague of industrial policy. Now, we used to think that industrial policy uh, was, you know, like bow ties or men's hats, you know, something that belonged in the past. You know, it was, it was in fashion for a little while, but then it, it went out of fashion. Well, it did not. Uh, in the last few years, you got uh, increasing calls to uh, reinstate proper industrial policy bodies uh, in all kinds of uh, nations and uh, economic systems. Uh, and, um, well, you know, it's a little bit of a shame for me to say uh, that this uh, tendency has actually been led uh, by an economist with an Italian sounding family name. Now, of course, you know, I can quote to you uh, Joseph Schumpeter that in his History of Economic Analysis at a certain point he says, you know, in the first 10 years of the 20th century, 
the Italian economy school was second to none in Europe. Well, you know, those times have passed a long time ago, but here we're talking about um, a scholar, a very prominent public intellectual these days, Professor Mariana Mazzucato, who has an Italian family name. She happens to have an Italian husband, something I will recommend to no woman on this planet. Um, but besides that, she's a product of uh, Anglo-Saxon academia, 100%. She's been um, uh, growing up in the United States and she's been teaching all her life in the UK. And yet, uh, she comes out of a particular school and she is really um, the front runner uh, of these new advocates for increasing intervention uh, based upon the assumption that, you know, whatever is good in economic progress, whatever works, any kind of innovation that actually changes the life of people uh, cannot be, just cannot be the output of a spontaneous trial and error market-like process. Uh, she published her book, uh, The Entrepreneurial State, first as a think tank uh, monograph uh, for a British think tank, and then it became a trade book. Um, the book was received as a book whose time has come from MIT, uh, Danny Roderick. Uh, it was celebrated widely in The Economist, The Financial Times. You know, Martin Wolf, a former advocate of the market economy, uh, wrote about the book that the failure to recognize the role of the government in driving innovation may well be the greatest threat to rising prosperity. Now, I, I find this really laughable, so I'm surprised you're not laughing. So let me read it again. The failure to recognize the role of the government in driving innovation, the failure to recognize the role of the government in driving innovation may well be the greatest threat, not one of the problems, the greatest threat to rising prosperity. Okay, so that's Martin Wolf's reaction to Mariana Mazzucato's book. There are plenty of drivers of a new industrial policy approach of which Mazzucato is providing a narrative for. And this narrative is, is, is very influential. Uh, Mazzucato has been substantially involved in post-pandemic policy drafting all around the world and particularly in the European Union. Um, she's been recognized by different governments from the UK one to the Italian one appointing her uh, as an advisor though happily, you know, advisors to the government are not very effective, whatever their positions are. Um, and most recently, I mean, last week, uh, in spite of being, and you know, this is a matter that has nothing to do with industrial policy, but in, in spite of being a, a prominent uh, advocate of women's rights and abortion, uh, she's be appointed by the Pope as a member of the Pontifical Academy for Life. I suppose life has something to do with industrial policy, but I'm not, I'm not as creative as to understand what it may be. Uh, the drivers of this new industrial policy approach uh, are actually in the world we live in uh, different, and, and, and they have a different level of uh, seriousness behind them. Of course, you know, you got remanufacturing as a response to globalization, a trend uh, that has been going on, at least on paper, in Western states for the last few years. Nowadays, we, we, we move slightly away of that into French shoring, but the logic of remanufacturing was basically subsidizing companies to bring back manufacturing job to rich countries. Um, this is, you know, something that makes industrial policy these days particularly popular, for example, among American Republicans. Well, another problem uh, that may bring uh, some people to flirt with industrial policy is the way that somehow heavy states need to compete with more attractive fiscal regimes. And therefore, you know, instead of uh, cutting taxes, which is difficult, a better way is to give away subsidies. 
in order to keep those companies between, within, I'm sorry, their own jurisdiction. And of course, these subsidies need to be crafted in a way that they sound um, pro-innovation, future-proof, as somebody says, or, you know, green enough, uh, roughly speaking. And lastly, and this is my favorite argument for industrial policy, this is a particular enterprise Professor Mazzucato is engaged with. Uh, Professor Mazzucato thinks uh, in a very uh, postmodern uh, Chantal Mouffe kind of way um, that really what matters in politics are words. Words shape uh, the horizon of politicians and voters. So uh, she's engaged by her own admission, by her own words, in a discursive battle, a battle of words. And the idea is that the government is actually great if it is, if it is perceived as inefficient and corrupt, it's um, only because of the evil influence of free market economists. Now, I don't see you laughing again, but that's as laughable as the thing before. So she thinks, you know, uh, the government typically works great, uh, but the problem the government has is a problem of PR, basically. So government needs better PR, and she's doing that. So that's, that's her, by the way. She's a very uh, effective speaker. She's also a, a very attractive communicator, different than, than me. Um, why is she so fortunate? Why is she so influential? Uh, I think there are a bunch of reasons. First of all, she um, took a very intelligent, argumentative path. So instead of uh, surveying the world for examples of industrial policy that go under the name industrial policy and that can be thus uh, evaluated and measured in its result as such, she decided to look uh, into the US economy and to stipulate that the American government was doing industrial policy and whatever beautiful and technological is coming out of the American economy is basically because in the 1960s or in the 1970s, um, the government invested in a procurement for the U.S. Army and, you know, something came out that eventually transformed itself into a product that people like you and me uh, end up using uh, every day. So basically, the core argument of the book is um, the U.S. government funded the development of GPS in order to have an advantage in war. And actually, when the government was doing that, when the U.S. government was doing that, it was planning for all of you to have Google Maps. That's, that's the essence of the idea. Um, it's an idea which is popular because uh, among many people, uh, it brings by what we may call a ha-ha effect. So it basically reinforces some biases that are already there. Um, there are some people who really think uh, that the market economy cannot work. And so for them, any instance in which the market economy apparently works uh, is an intellectual challenge. And Mazzucato helps them in meeting this intellectual challenge by saying, well, it's not really the market economy. Is, is government investment 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And why is she effective and um, useful you know, to her side and, um, and dangerous perhaps to people that have a different views uh, of uh, what's the proper balance between uh, government and the private sector is? I think it, it, it's nicely expressed in this a uh, little quotation by Milton Friedman over there that comes to, from an interview uh, Friedman gave in 1970 to uh, Reason magazine. The interviewers were Tibor McCann and Ralph Reiko. And, and Friedman says, you know, it's, we are very lucky uh, that the capitalist economy is so productive because if it was not, it would not be tolerated. The bias against it are so great that it's got to have a five to one advantage in order to survive. Now, uh, the only authors on the other side that Professor Mazzucato quotes from time to time 
are public choice economists and, and, and not public choice economists in a plural sense, but only one monograph uh, co-edited by Arthur Seldon and Gordon Brady and published by the Institute of Economic Affairs in the uh, late 1990s. So that's, that's as much as knowledge of the opposite um, view she has. And she tends to, you know, to present this, this strange view by which uh, Jim Buchanan is, is Robert Nozick or, or something like that. But in a way, she's addressing exactly that problem. She thinks that um, the discursive battle is not going in the right direction because people tend to see uh, all of the bounties, all of the new technologies that are coming out of a, you know, not particularly free, but certainly freer than she'd like uh, market economy, and therefore they're not properly appreciating the role of the government in fostering this kind of innovation. One important side of her argument uh, with which uh, Deidre and I struggle with a bit in our book is that, of course, um, Mazzucato goes um, in this direction because she has the impression uh, that there is some sort of super mystic rhetoric being played uh, in the aid of businessmen. She thinks, you know, we live in a world in which um, Elon Musk and Richard Branson are, are considered as stars. And instead, what is unseen is the way more important um, role that government bureaucrats are playing in, in allocating resources. Um, She's using, not directly, but she's using exactly the kind of reasoning that Barack Obama resorted to in his famous, you didn't do that speech. So in that speech, uh, that was basically arguing for uh, higher taxes for richer people at the end of the day, which is one of the things that Mazzucato really wants to have, which is higher taxes for businesses. Uh, Obama said, if you were successful, somebody along the line gave you some help, somebody helped to create this unbelievable American system that we have that allowed you to thrive. Somebody invested in roads and bridges. If you got a business, you didn't build that. Somebody else made that happen. And I think, you know, there's, there are very little reason to quarrel with this on a certain level. I mean, innovation per se is... Uh, a cooperative enterprise of many. It clearly builds on the past, on experience. And you know, lots of people may help you even casually uh, so that you end up uh, coming up with your own great research or your own great product. But this does not necessarily mean that you need to send a thank you letter to the IRS or whatever is called your tax system in your own country. Neither does mean that you know the greatest, um, I mean, I think in a way, Jeff Bezos put it very nicely in a speech he gave uh, when he launched his space uh, project. You know, when he launched his space project, he said, you know, I, I'm, I'm very cautious that we have Amazon because somebody before invented the stamp, uh, somebody perfected logistic, uh, somebody got the automobile out of, your, out of his hat. But this doesn't really mean the people that uh, uh, finance the streets in Seattle upon which Jeff Bezos is biking in the weekend needs to get a chunk of Amazon's uh, profit whenever they're coming. Moreover, the idea that um, government is responsible for certain innovation um, is very naive because the idea is once again that you can have very clear very immediate causal links between one project and one outcome and one effect or a new technology coming out years later. Um, in a sense, I suppose, the, the good part of uh, Obama's uh, lesson gets totally lost. You stop looking uh, at economic progress and technological progress for that matter as a cooperative long-time enterprise and you basically think that it is one single thing, it is one single human being that crucially determines the development uh, of some technology. When it comes to Mazzucato, her book is called The Entrepreneurial State. It should better be called The Entrepreneurial Army, 
because most of the innovations she is rooting for are actually coming from um, army procurement in the United States. I just wanted to give you three examples of, uh, I mean, the three silver bullets for her case that she presents to the reader. Now, the first one uh, is something which is called SBIR. So it's uh, federal resources are located uh, by the US government uh, to comparatively small businesses in order that these comparatively small businesses can invest into research. Now, um, most of people familiar with public choice will look at this and will sniff lobbying, and will sniff a way to please a particular kind of voter, a particular kind of uh, vested interest. But let's assume it is not. I mean, let's assume for a moment that this is completely unrelated uh, with political consensus. Even if it is, uh, what it's actually and effectively doing is financing private businesses uh, in a way without requiring them to produce any particular output that fits you know, the bill uh, of a certain choice in technology. When it comes to industrial policy, the standard kind, I mean, it's, it's about picking winners. That's, that's the idea behind it. Yeah, you're not picking a winner. You're just giving away money, which is a different thing. Uh, Mazzucato's favorite example is the iPhone. And when it comes to the iPhone and the reason why she, we should all be thankful to the American government for the iPhone and not to Steve Jobs, her main argument is the following one. Touchscreen technology is actually very old. It goes back to the 1950s, and, and of course, and not like these, but you know, the idea and the first application go back to the 1950s. But at a certain moment, there is one guy, uh, this man named Wayne Westerman, who developed for totally different purposes. I mean, not to uh, have them applied in um, the sort of device we use every day, uh, but to help people that have problems with moving their hands and typing on a keyboard. Uh, basically, the touchscreen technology that ends up in the iPhone. This man is smart. And as it happens to smart men, at least from time to time, he got a scholarship. And this scholarship was funded, half of it, by the National Science Foundation, and then he developed his own business in order to you know, make this idea into a thing. And, and when he did so, his university was one of the first investors in this venue. Okay. So this means, according to Professor Mazzucato, that the American government is behind task screen. To me, it means exactly the opposite, which is innovation is done by people by human beings. These are the people that, these are the engine of innovation. But she thinks, you know, this came out of government. And the third one is, of course, the most delicate, the most uh, interesting point, is that the internet as such is, uh, you know, basically the offspring of military spending. Because DARPA in the 70s began to develop some sort of network and develop some of the protocol upon which the internet is based. Now, that's factually true, but of course, the purpose was different. Uh, there was no commercial use of the Internet. Commercial use in the Internet comes in the U.S. after 1995, and it was received at that time precisely as a liberalization, as opening up the Internet to the private sector. And at the very same time, lots of things that gets into uh, the recipe, so to say, of, of the Internet uh, are coming totally from the private sector, like the TCIP protocol or um, carbon fiber um, telephone lines. So in a way, uh, I think that when we uh, think about the government promoting innovation, uh, we should be thinking of something like Christopher Columbus ending up in America. That's true. It ended up there. And the government sometimes, you know, it, it will be ridiculous even to conceive that an agency that basically commands half of GDP in most Western countries uh, is not, you know, employing some of these resources in ways that at a certain moment in history uh, become innovation that are useful to people. It would be laughable, uh, it's said. I mean, of course, some of this money 
is ending up in the hands of innovative people. But broadly speaking, the key point is that you don't have the sort of causality uh, that Mazzucato thinks it is there, to the point that she talks about mission directionality. The idea is that whenever the government is uh, being the pattern of a research, of a research program, is certainly know where it's going to be ending up. I just want to give you, um, very briefly, some pictures about real, proper industrial policy. Industrial policy that was pursued by a government who thought it could pick winners, it should pick winners, and particularly that it should be allocating resources in order to benefit areas that were poorer and where the intelligence and ability of people should be, uh, you know, freed and liberated uh, by a proper flow of government capital. Naples, Bagnoli, a tremendous factory, never particularly productive, built right on the Neapolitan seaside. It's exactly where, I suppose, you would put such a factory. Um, a tremendous failure, uh, a company too difficult to privatize even, and uh, to this day, well, not to these days, but two, a few years ago, uh, a tremendous center of, uh, of crime and, uh, and social problems as well in Naples, as if they didn't have enough. Termini Imerese in Palermo, a government subsidized factory, which ended up subsidizing an important company from the north of Italy going to the Sicilian coast, forcing uh, locals to get into a sort of production they had no taste for, and quite frankly, they should not have any taste for, given the particular uh, feature of the place they're living in. Italy, at a certain point, uh, was really uh, the heaven of industrial policy. So the government was, of course, owning uh, salt mines, why not? Uh, panettone, the Italian Christmas cake factory, ice cream makers, um, glass makers, television, uh, lotteries, airlines, well, today we do steel and, and trains uh, as well. So this is uh, a quick quote you may give a look at. Basically, you know, in the 70s, 80s, and even 90s, um, the average Italian was living uh, by, you know, um, directly and indirectly subsidizing all these kind of businesses, and of course was A, a tremendous mess, B, tremendously inefficient, and C, it bred widespread corruption of the sort that you have when basically the government is controlling, roughly speaking, 60% of the Italian economy. I'm coming to a close, and my uh, distinguished co-author, who will have given you a much better talk, is of course known as a scholar of bourgeois virtue and bourgeois dignity. She published this uh, great collection of books in which she, this trilogy, as she will say, and I'm saying to you as well, they make a great Christmas present um, about culture and the importance of bourgeois culture for the industrial takeover of the West. So I always wonder what is uh, bourgeois culture really. And lately, as I was working on Richard Cobden, I came across this quotation by Cobden. As you know, Cobden was a great free trade activist in England. At a certain point, uh, he goes to France and he convinces Napoleon III uh, to have a free trade agreement, which was not something Cobden wanted because Cobden thought that free trade agreements were typically bad because they allow too much maneuver for lobbyists uh, into the AS jargon. But he thought, you know, the, the Brits were a bit crazy at the time. They were always in the fear of a French invasion. And so this treaty was really um, a moment in which a new partnership, a new friendship was forged uh, between these two countries. And um, when he met uh, Napoleon III, Cobden notes, I never saw a person with fewer heroic traits 
in his appearance and manners. And this is a compliment for Cobden, okay? The emperor doesn't look like his uncle, doesn't look like a conqueror. And when he comes uh, to bourgeois hero and industrial policy, um, I think what's at the end of it really is the desperate need for so, by so many people to have an ear of the story, uh, to have a plot, to see the economy as something which is authored uh, as a novel and to praise the author of the novel. And of course, there's no better author than uh, the government, than the state. So I, I think, looking at you, mo most of you will be of an age that allows you to see over here one of the greatest moments in uh, contemporary American movie making is Shrek, uh, the fairy grandmother. Uh, singing, I need a hero, when of course she wants to smuggle uh, Prince Charming as uh, Shrek to Fiona. I also need to remind you of this great uh, movie um, moment that comes after. So I suppose that in essence my talk can be summarized as, you know, trying to be a giant, um, a giant cookie marching on the good side rather than a fairy um, godmother on the other side. Um, but uh, let me just finish uh, with these. Okay, I think the, the search for heroism is quite widespread in society. It, it really um, enthuses also uh, economic commentaries, journalism, politics, of course, not to mention that. Um, it goes together in Mazzucato with a very bizarre thing that we call in our book the supply chain fallacy. So basically the idea that anything which is in a certain supply chain ought to be there and cannot be substituted with anything else. And of course this is a very important fallacy also these days. You know, in most of the conversation we do have uh, when it comes to globalization, the idea is that, you know, it's not that businesses are engaged in substitutions every day. Uh, it's not like consumers are always pushing businesses to come up with new solutions and with cheaper ones. It's simply the world needs to be, as it always was. Uh, the economy is like a book that was written by, uh, by somebody. And the only thing that stands in the way of greater innovation is the profit motive. And, you know, to get greater innovation, it's quite easy. Uh, just put unlimited capital in the end of everybody asking for it, and some wonderful innovation in the future will come by. Which, of course, may be true, uh, but, you know, we are not talking about very sophisticated economics like you did before, but simply about opportunity cost, which like the very essence of the role of the consumer, is something which is, alas, completely out of Professor Mazzucato's horizon. Thank you very much. Should we entertain some questions or run to the break? So I actually have a comment about the quote from the quote from Wolf uh, about the book. I assume in I think it was the quote that you said that why are we not laughing? And it was, as I remember, um, the failure to understand the role of the government in fostering production is a threat. And I just thought that if you think about the statement, it is actually, it is actually true, but it's the failure to understand the negative role of the government, or you could say this failure to understand the role of the government and then put it on a book and then it would be appropriate. That's just a thought I had. Well, I totally agree with you, but you know, it's, um, it's a very funny thing. Uh, whenever you're reading um, contemporary critics of the market economy, Let's put, let's do like this. When I was going to the, when I was uh, studying, when I was going to, to university for classes, which is, you know, uh, quite a few years ago, 
Um, and people still used to read papers, papers made of papers. You, you go to a newspaper shop and you buy one. When I was depressed, uh, I typically went to the newspaper shop and bought Il Manifesto, which is the communist newspaper in Italy. Uh, Silvio Berlusconi was at the time prime minister. I thought that, you know, certainly he, he was very helpful in, in keeping the country well entertained. Uh, but when it comes to policy advancements, they were not great. But whenever I read the Il Manifesto, when I had it in my hands, I got the impression, wow, wow you know, it's, it's, we're basically ruled by some, somebody who is between Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and, um, and, and somebody like that. I mean, it was just amazing. So it's like when you're reading uh, some of these people, you, you, you always got the impression you're living in 1828. So public spending is 7% of GDP. Uh, the government is not involved in anything. We really need to do something. Uh, and then, of course, you wake up and you see that public spending is 50-ish percent of GDP, 56% in France, 48-49% uh, in Italy, and so on and so forth. So, uh, in a way, it's a very interesting way of crafting a discussion. I, I also want to say something still, you know, this way I'll, I'll walk you towards the break gently. Uh, one thing which I believe is, is, is very dangerous in, in this kind of book, besides his influence. And I'm not talking as a, as a free marketer now. Is that, of course, you know, um, opinionated scholars and opinionated thinkers always wrote book with a thesis. But the way in which you write a book with a thesis is that you typically try to imagine the counter-arguments of your intellectual enemies and you try to answer them. That's, that's a standard practice. I mean, it's not a particularly novel methodology. But if you think uh, that we are in a discursive battle and the only problem really, a problem of PRs and words, what you end up doing is basically you keep repeating the same thing and you repeat it uh, long enough and that it becomes true. And this is really uh, barbarism when it comes to the intellectual discussion, and when it comes to politics as well, because it breeds a sort of attitude according to which you're not in the business of persuading people who don't agree with you, and so you, you need to provide them with arguments, but you just, you just mean to uh, please the people that agree with you, and when it comes to the other, the only important thing is that they're not allowed to speak. You mentioned 50 fish as a public spending. Is it all or nothing in your opinion? Is it the answer zero or is it somewhere in between? Of course, my preferences uh, incline strongly in the zero direction. Uh, but you know, I know that's not gonna be happening anytime, uh, anytime soon. Uh, I will be content if we go back into understanding, A, that having half of the national product, which is public spending, is a problem. And, and that's a point of view which, in the last few years, with QE first and the pandemic second, has been totally erased, basically, by, uh, by the public arena. So, I mean, in, I live in a country where, um, basically, uh, the public debt is 150% of GDP. And in 2011, people of all persuasions used to think that that was a problem, that that was a check upon what they could or couldn't do. And nowadays, nobody thinks it's a problem. We are all convinced that the public debt is big enough to take care of itself, uh, so to say. And, and, and that's dreadful. And the second thing, you know, once again, uh, as, as a very limited provision. I would like to, you know, people at least entertain an understanding of the fact that, you know, it's, it, 
government money, which is really taxpayers' money, today taxpayers or future taxpayers' money, um, has an opportunity cost as well. It, it's, it's not so crazy to believe that if you leave more of that money in the hands of people, uh, they will actually be doing something they care with it. And this stuff that, we, that they care about may actually be more beneficial to society at large. Once again, I think in this regard, we do live in a very schizophrenic era. I come from a country where if you, you know, if you just talk with the average Italian about their politicians, uh, the average Italian opinion of their politician will be they're crooks, they're idiots, or they're idiot crooks. That's, that's a common consensus, left and right. Everybody knows that. But then you ask uh, to the same person, uh, do you think that broadband should be a fundamental human right enforced by the state? Yes. Uh, should the government do more for, yes. So it's, 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 it's schizophrenia. If you believe that you send to the parliament the best and brightest, I understand why you want them to be uh, basically in control of half of the country's half of the country product. But if you think they're a bunch of crooks and idiots, why do you want them to decide how to spend your money? So I think once again, you know, th these are very basic things. I mean, there's there's, there's nothing particularly complicated about them. Uh, somehow, you know, common sense economics. Let's 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 call it this way. Uh, but the terrible thing is that with these new, new uh, economics that we experimented in the last few years, this common sense is uh, increasingly out of the picture, um, at least, you know, in Western European countries. And I hope it, well, I hope it's not so much uh, here, if at least, you know, that there's some, sort of, some broad support for the quantitative theory of money among Polish economists. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dad, for your patience and, and attention.